afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, sticking up with us. So my name is Gaëtan. I am an um, executive in residence at Singular Capital Partners. Singular is a European VC firm that invests in uh, European founders with global ambitions. We invest across all sectors from C to Series B with a, a special focus on, on Series A stage. Uh, before Singular, I used to be at, uh, at Algolia, a company that I joined quite early as the second employee. And there at Algolia, I've built uh, pretty much the, the revenue engine from scratch. And today, the company is over a couple hundred million in, uh, in revenue. So I've seen and experienced firsthand the, all the different stages of growth and the challenges of keeping um, uh, our growth really high. And growth is the Growth is the team that we're going to talk about today. Um, the first question that I wanted to cover with you today is, does growth still matter, especially in the current context? And usually when people talk about growth, is either you grow or you drive profitability. You usually put those two in and opposite. And why? Because people tend to think that those two explain companies' valuations and, and valuation multiples. So let's take a look at whether this statement is, is true or not. Um, there's a, a framework that was developed in, uh, back in 2015 called the Rule of 40. So I don't know if, if you guys know that, that framework, but pretty much what it says is that when you add your growth and your free cash flow margin, that score should be above 40. Why? Because when you look at uh, public SaaS companies out there, those who have a score over 40 represent 42% of, of those companies. But combined, they actually represent 77% of uh, the, the market cap of that group. Okay, so those two metrics actually do correlate with valuation. But now you could wonder, and that's usually the fight that you, that, 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 that you fight is, is growth more or less important than profitability? Okay, which one should we pick? So Bessemer uh, came up with a slight variation of the rule of 40 back in 2016, and they've called it the rule of X. And the rule of X is the same logic, it's a score, but instead of taking the growth, you take a multiplier of the growth. So here the score is two or twice, two times the growth plus the free cash flow margin. And when you see, when you compute that score, it actually explains about two thirds of the company's, public company's valuations. So on that chart, what you see is on the X axis, it's that score on the rule of X, and up there are the companies that have the highest valuation multiples. So you see Snowflake, you see Datadog, and all the top companies out there. So what the rule says as well is that a one percentage point in lost growth has twice the negative impact than a lost point in uh, lose lost profitability. So the message here is that even for larger companies, um, don't, um, don't kill your growth for the sake of profitability. Um, so keeping your growth at a high level is very, very important. So the message here, and, and you got it in the title of the presentation, is uh, controlling your growth decay is very important if you want to keep your company's valuation and valuation multiples high. So um, I have a physics background. I love to understand things. So now I really wanted to understand why and how does growth actually correlate with company's valuation. Because we all know that, but we don't know why. So we'll take a, and I hope you guys are awake, we'll do a little bit of physics here and you're going to see some charts. So the physics of growth. The first topic that I wanted to cover was the myth of exponential growth. I'm sorry to break it to you, but exponential growth does not exist. So what is, or what should be exponential growth? That's typically the way a virus would spread in a population. Um, so one individual would infect three people, that each would infect three, and so on and so on. So when you look at the trajectory, the growth trajectory of a virus that diffuses itself inside a population, you should see the curve that you see on the right-hand side. That's an exponential curve. And when you apply this to technical products, what looks and what has the same characteristics as a virus? Social networks. Because in order for a social network to deliver its value, the users need to add and invite other users. And when you look at the growth trajectories of the top social and social networks out there, uh, they don't look anything but like a, a, an exponential growth. So this is uh, the number of monthly active users of Facebook and, and uh, Slack. So you definitely see that those two do not look like an exponential. So now you could ask yourself, all right, so do virus actually spread exponentially? And the answer is no. Why? Because there's something people tend to forget. The population is limited. 
and that's you know what is in this chart called the carrying cap capacity of the population. So the way viruses actually diffuse and spread inside the population, indeed it does start exponentially, but then it moves into quadratic linear and to end up with that that shape that we all know the S shape. So the S shape is actually how a virus spreads itself inside the population. And that model, the viral diffusion model, is actually a model that has been used to describe the diffusion of technology since the 60s. It's a man called uh, Eve Rogers who came up with this in 1962. So from now on the presentation, we'll, we'll assume that technology spreads itself like a virus, all right? So, and to confirm this, we'll look at the technology that has been out there for quite some time. If you look at the diffusion of the internet, it does follow that S curve and that S shape. Why? Because internet is reaching the carrying capacity of the global population. So this year, there's about five and a half billion people who have access to the internet. And you see that it is reaching a plateau there. And um, once you start using this model, a lot of things start to emerge, very interesting things. So we'll take the example of two companies, company one and company two, the one in blue and the one in red. And let's say that company one, is at $10 million in revenue and growing at 170% year over year. Company two is also at $10 million in revenue, but growing at 100% growth year over year. So those two companies, although they have the same revenue, they're at the different point of their diffusion, okay? Company two is further into the, the curve. So the first thing that is interesting is that once you start using the viral diffusion model, very early in the life of the company, you're able to predict the end market of that company, which, what's the size of the market that they're dealing with. And as we all know, company's valuation, it's a direct reflection of the addressable market that you are playing with. So in this case, company one is dealing with a billion dollar market, 100 times their revenue. So that's what would explain why company one may have a higher valuation. Company two, they're playing in a $200 million playground, a fourth of the size of the first company. So the first thing that is interesting, revenue is not enough to explain the valuation of a company. Now there's something else that is very counterintuitive, is if you take second company, but you look at that company a few years in the future, that company has grown, now they are at 40 million in revenue, and they're still growing at a healthy 40% year over year growth. So you may think company, you know, revenue has grown, company is still growing, so, rev so market cap should grow, right? No, valuation should grow. The answer is not necessarily. All they've done, they've just kept diffusing the technology in a market that hasn't changed. The end market is still the same. So what's interesting there is that revenue is not enough. Growth itself is not enough to predict and it does not correlate with higher valuation necessarily. So what does? What does it take to grow your valuation? What it does take is to increase your addressable market. As you're growing, you need to keep growing and need to grow the market that you're playing with. And how do you grow your market? Shocker, it's by keeping a high growth endurance. So we'll spend a few minutes on this, on this. But first to define it, what is growth endurance? So growth endurance is the growth of your current year compared to the growth of the prior year. Um, so if we look at the, if we go back to our viral uh, diffusion model, and if we look at how the growth evolves over time in a typical viral model, so growth goes down, and that's one of the constant in the universe. Growth usually always goes down and slows down. It's very, very rare that the growth rate goes up. And the growth, the trend of the growth for a viral diffusion um, looks like this. And to give you an example of a growth endurance, we looked at year nine. So the growth endurance of that distribution in year nine would be 82%. So that's 74 over 90. So here at this stage, you realize, all right, so growth slows down and it slows down at a rate of pace of 82%. Um, is that stable? The answer is no, because when you look at the growth endurance itself, and that's, that's the last complex one, okay? But when you look at the trend of the growth endurance, it also goes down. So what that means is that not only in a viral diffusion model, your growth slows down, but the way it slows down actually accelerates. And, um, and if you look at the, the top companies out there, uh, the ones that have the highest uh, market caps compared to their, their revenue, 
Um, those companies are companies that have managed to maintain very, very high growth and durian rates. If you look at Salesforce, over the last few years, they've able, been able to maintain 95% growth endurance. HubSpot, they are 93%. So what that means is that these companies, at some point of the diffusion of their technology, they've managed to stabilize the endurance of their growth at pretty high levels. So the top companies out there are above 80% growth endurance. Uh, better companies are around 70%. OK companies are at 60%. So here you may think, all right, but we're only talking about 10, 15 percentage points. So what's the big deal? Um, it's actually a huge deal. So what that means is if you go back to that diffusion of, of your technology, if you manage to maintain 85% growth endurance, that's the, the, the curve in red, what it actually shows is that your end market once you stabilize your growth endurance, is 10 times larger than the initial market you were playing with, 10 times bigger. If you stabilize your endurance at 70%, the end market is only 40% larger. And if you stabilize it at 60%, we're only playing in an 8% larger market. So not only is it very important to keep a high growth endurance, but it's very important to start working and focusing on that endurance very, very early in the life of the company. Because if you start tackling that problem a little late, it's too late. It won't have any impact on the end market that you're playing with, and no impact, limited impact on your company's valuation. Um, and that's what pretty much explains why very large companies in the public market still show very high multiples against revenue, not against their profitability. Um, so the higher growth endurance, I hope you, know, you guys understood, it, is a sign of a growing addressable market. And, and if you want to grow your valuation, you need to keep a high growth endurance. So now the question is, okay, all right, cool, but how do I do that? It's actually not that hard in, in theory. Um, all you need to do is stack up S-curves. So as in the life of your company, as you're growing, you need to start stacking up those S-curves. And when you do that, this is what it would take to keep an 85% growth endurance rate. So that's what companies like HubSpot did. Typically, as they were growing, they kept shipping new products. And as they ship new products, they open new markets. Because there's one thing that is interesting in the last, in the previous chart is keeping a high growth rate doesn't mean that you're capturing market share faster. What it actually means is that you're opening new markets, you're creating new markets. And that's what companies do when they launch new products. And that's what has allowed HubSpot to keep a 90% plus growth endurance over time. And today HubSpot is uh, priced at 14 times, uh, 14 times its revenue, which is insanely high. So, just to conclude quickly, so what we saw here in this section is that if you want to keep a high, if you want your valuation to go up and to keep a high multiple, revenue is not enough, growth is not enough, it's the growth endurance that actually matters. So now, okay, we saw that, you need to keep a high growth endurance. You keep a high growth endurance if you stack up s curve. So now, how do you actually build an s curve? And especially, how do you build the original s curve, the first one, the one that most of you folks in the room are probably busy building right now? So we've seen that earlier in the presentation, that the model that explains and that um, uh, um, shows how innovation diffuses itself over time is, is the viral model. So on that chart, that would be the yellow, the yellow curve. So in a normal viral system, all technologies and innovations that have shown a very strong initial traction, typically companies that you hear are you know, in um, hyper, uh, hyper growth or viral, they should follow that trajectory, that yellow trajectory. The fact of the matter is a lot of those companies, if not most of those companies, at some point see their growth massively slow down. So a much higher growth decay than what you would you normally anticipate with, uh, with the viral model. Something happens between the early adopters and the mainstream market uh, that most companies don't understand. So, there's something that is very important. There's a very important assumption in the viral diffusion model. It's that the population has to be homogeneous. And there's a theory that was developed about 30 years ago by uh, Geoffrey Moore that pretty much says that the population, when it comes to innovation, is absolutely not homogeneous. Uh, it's even worse than this. There's pretty much two groups that are almost opposite to one another. On one side, you have the early adopters. On the other side, you have the mainstream market. And between the two, you have the chasm.
And the way those populations are, are different is in the way they perceive innovation and, and disruptions. So another equation that sort of I tried to take a stab at explaining how people make decisions. Um, uh, at least that's how I make decisions. If the upside of that decision is higher than the risk of making that decision, I move forward, I call the shot. Um, and the way those two populations think about adopting an innovation and disruption is actually in total opposites. So for the early adopters, being the first is actually the upside. It's the folks who will wait in line in front of the Apple store for an entire weekend to get the latest iPhone 16. It's, you know, and, and, and for them, not being first is actually the risk, because there's some type of like social reward in identifying the new trend. On the other side, the mainstream market it's people who are very, very pragmatic, and I've seen it firsthand at Algolia. Um, it's people who see innovations as a risk because what if it doesn't work? I may lose my job. You know, you guys have all heard about the IBM thing. You know, no one has ever been fired for uh, choosing IBM. We're typically in that type of situation, and and for them, uh, following the herd is the upside. Okay, I bought this same thing that my direct competitor did, so they tend to follow a lot. So the thing that happens is that these two populations not only don't overlap, but they don't listen to each other, and in some instances, they don't even respect each other. Uh, think about that weirdo that keeps coming at you with that latest Bitcoin thing, you know, like, yeah, whatever. That's, that's this type of situation that we're dealing with. So what that feels like for uh, entrepreneurs who have seen a, a very strong initial traction is, you know, they're baffled because it feels like they have to start again from scratch. Um, so what do you do now, okay, if you start from scratch? So how do you... Uh, uh, how do you build you know, a virality in a population of pragmatists? So the way you do that, because we know that the, diffusion, the viral diffusion model works, you need to recreate the conditions for viral diffusion. So there's a two things that are very important. The number one is you need to create and to target a homogeneous population. And in, in simpler terms, you need to identify a single economic buyer. Very, very important. So for us at Algolia, it was one title. It was a head of e-commerce. That was, you know, same title, across in businesses. The second thing is this uh, population of economic buyers needs to be very tightly connected. So you need word of mouth to happen between this population. So for us, it was not enough that we were going after head of e-commerce. It was not enough that we were going had after head of e-commerce in fashion. It had to be going after head of e-commerce in fashion in marketplaces. Because these people talk to each other, they know each other, they go to the same conferences. If they change job, if you, I don't know, they change, you know, if, if you go from Depop and then you may go to uh, Vestia Collective, right? It's a very, very tightly connected network. Um, the next thing that is very important is in the way this population makes its decision, they follow the pack. So that means that that means that you need to pick um, an opponent of your size here. So in, in this context, size is very important, but not the way you think. Um, you need to be. You don't need to become a big fish in a big pond. You need to pick a small pond so that from the get-go you're a big fish. So here, actually. Going after something small, being very targeted, is really, really important. So once you've done that exercise, and we did that exercise at Algolia, you have a list of uh, target segment candidates. How do you prioritize those? Because you only need to pick one. Um, there's a few things that we looked at. One is, is there a compelling reason to buy? And, and by that, I mean, is there a, an economic impact for not changing the status quo, for not um, moving for, yeah, for not making that decision? Typically, the best environments are those where there's, you know, regulation that changes or something like that that sort of like forces all that population to move. Uh, the next thing that is very, very critical is uh, your product needs to be as complete as possible for this population. They do not like half-baked features or half-baked product like the early uh, adopters would be okay with. They're not okay with that. Um, and there's a few other things. One other thing that is very important is if you have already a very strong respected reference that you've managed to acquire in the early adopter phase, leverage that. Uh, there's like, for instance, for us at Algolia in the retail space, there's one brand in France that is very early adopter, but it's a huge account, it's an enterprise account, and it's respect respected by its peers. 
Um, and the last thing that is important is, is, are there adjacencies that exist between that initial niche and other niches? Once you've selected uh, your target, what do you do? You launch the assault. And in, in crossing the chasm, that's the analogy that they use, and it really feels like that. Um, you going at war, and you send everything that you have against that, um, that target segment. Um, you know, your marketing materials, your, your ad spend, your uh, pretty much like, really like the D-Day, right? To free Europe, you could, we could have gone after the entire coast. They just selected a few beaches, and they went with an you know, overwhelming amount of power. Um, that's what it takes. And, and after you've opened and you've managed to create your first beachhead, what do you do? You pick the next one. And for us, picking the next one was, all right, so we're very strong in e-commerce, fashion, marketplaces. So now we're going to do e-commerce, fashion, D2C. And it's by adjacencies like that, that one after the other, the pin starts to fall. And that's the, the they call that the bowling alley model in, 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 in the book. What we're actually doing when we do that, we're stacking up S-curves. Right. Exactly what I talked about earlier in the presentation. So one niche after another, after another, after another. And when you stack up S-curves, what do you do? You stop growth decay. And that's how you cross the chasm. And that's literally like what we did and how we approached that. Another example of something that we did after being successful in e-commerce B2C, we went after e-commerce B2B. Why? Because usually there's some accounts that have both channels, B2C and B2B, and the folks who manage the B2B line of business sit pretty much in the same office as the one who managed the B2C. So we leverage the connection and the network effect here as well. So what does that mean for you guys in the room? What should you guys do, do differently? Because what, what we've seen so far is that um, the viral diffusion model works at every scale. Right, from that very, very initial S curve all the way up to $100 billion in market caps. Um, and who built the first S curve? It's you guys, it's the founders. But there's this belief out there that at scale, you need to start hiring professional management. Right? That the founder's DNA needs to leave room for professional management. Um, the conventional wisdom in the Silicon Valley is that once a kid creates something big and something great, um, the adults need to be brought in to make it big. Um, instead, what we believe, you know, what I believe is that um, the founders, by their very natures, are capable of doing things that professional managers can't. Uh, we believe that it's this original driving force, the founder's mentality, the founder's mindset that once applied at scale allows small companies to become giants. So what is so special about the founder's mentality and the founder's mindset? So three things that Bain described uh, back in 20, I think it was in 2016. The first thing is a very, very strong sense of insurgency. Um, the most successful founders would uh, describe that startup phase as going at war. Uh, like, remember the D-Day analogy? You go at war after an industry, an incumbent, um, on behalf of underserved uh, customers. It's really about a, a status quo that is just unbearable. You can't stand it, you have to fix it. So there's a lot of intensity here in how you feel about what you're doing. Uh, the second thing is having a very strong owner's mindset. So here, the difference between an employee who would operate with the owner mentality and employees who, who wouldn't uh, can be as big as the difference between parents and a babysitter. Um, another analogy that uh, they give and that Bain gives is um, if you take a restaurant, the owner of a restaurant, they see another restaurant open across the street. For that founder, this is a threat. An employee would think that this is an opportunity. We all want our employees to see this restaurant as a threat. This is what having an owner mindset means. And the last, uh, the last trait is an obsession for the front line. Uh, founders live and breathe the front line. Um, they, 
they operate with a very, very deep curiosity for every detail of the customer experience. You know, that's what people always call, almost call like sometimes being like micromanaging, but they, they just can't help it. Um, they're super curious about how the business works, all like every detail. Um, they they build um, instincts at, at the ground level to make every decision. So the ground, the front line, is really what feeds the business. Um, so it's about you know an obsession for the customers, but it's also about an obsession for your own front line, your employees. Um, an example that I, I like to give is uh, Apple and Steve Jobs. Every year he would take uh, what they call the top 100 uh, employees at an annual retreat. But the way they would pick the employees was very interesting. It had nothing to do with the rank or the title. Um, it was who had and who could have the highest impact for Apple in the foreseeable future. So you could have you know, ICs part of those retreats. So skip levels, all of that, very, very important. Um, Olivier Pommel, the CEO of Datadog, they said in, in an interview recently that for him what that means is the folks on his team should feel like peers. Like, if it feels like you're managing them, they're not the right people. So it's really feeling like you're surrounded by founders inside the company at all levels of, of the company. Um, and the data proves that this model works. If you look at the performance of founders-led companies, um, and even in the same sector, uh, those companies have a six-fold higher performance than other companies. So keeping that founder's mindset at all scales, that uh, just works. Um, so what I covered just here comes from a book that uh, Bain published a few years ago called The Founder's Mentality. Uh, I would really, really highly advise you to read this book, especially now, especially as you're you know, starting this journey of hyper growth, hyper scale. There's a lot of good stories in this book. Also read the, the, the blog post that Paul Graham published back in September about the, um, the founder mode. Very, very interesting post. Um, so. In, in conclusion, to wrap up, um, for me, fighting growth decay, keeping your valuation high and your multiples high is easy. Uh, the idea is to keep that initial driving force, that founder's mentality, and scale it. And look for people who have it. They exist, okay? Being a founder doesn't mean you have created a company. It has nothing to do with that. It's a mindset. And at Algoya, yeah, we have found those founders in specific lines of the business. Our CRO, our CPO had that DNA. So, yeah, and like in a nutshell, you know, don't lose that that force and um, yeah so that's uh, that's what I wanted to share with you today thank you for um, listening <laughs>